Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our very special guest, Warren Buffett, Chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Warren, nice to see you. Good to see you. So it's March 10th and it's the day after the stock market crashed. The Dow was down over 2,000 points. Oil cratered to $30 okay. a barrel or so. Uh, the 10-year bond went to below 0.5%. What the heck is going on, Warren Buffett? <laughs> well, I, I told you many years ago, if you, if you stick around long enough, you'll see everything in markets. And, and it may have taken me to 89 to <laughs> years of age to throw this one in the, into, into the uh, experience. But, you know, it, it, markets, if you, if you have to be open second by second, they react to news in a big time way. I mean, it's not like the market for real estate or farms or, you know, things of that sort. Uh, does this remind you of any other time? Well, I've certainly been a, lot, a fair number of times when panic has reigned in Wall Street and uh, October 19, 1987 and the period around it. I mean, there was, there was panic. On, on, at the close of business on Monday, October 19th, most of the specialist firms, which were important in those days on the New York Stock Exchange, were broke. And, uh, and the next morning there was a check due to the clearinghouse in Chicago that didn't get there. And, and sometime late in the morning, you know, a decision, I think Phelan had made the decision, you know, we're, we're gonna stay open, but, but it, it was really close. That, that, that was, and of course the financial panic, there were, uh, you had 35 million people on September 1st that weren't worried about, at all about their money market accounts on September 15th or 16th, they were all, how concerned are you about the coronavirus situation, Warren? Well, you got to defer to the doctors on that. But, uh, uh, you know, you can get into all these figures about how flu regularly kills, you know, 20 times as many people in this country as, or 40 times maybe as much as we've seen in the way of deaths, even more than that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it is a pandemic. It, it is really spread. So we, we've got something that we don't know how long it'll be with us. We don't know how severe it'll be. Uh, but uh, there will be uncertainty about that for a considerable period of time. There has to be. What precautions are you taking personally? Are, have you changed any of your habits? <laughs> well, I'm drinking a little more Coca-Cola, actually. That, that seems to have warded off everything else in life. I mean, I'm 89. I'm in, I, I just had, had two different doctors tell me I'm in much better shape than I was a few years ago. I'm not sure what I'm doing to get in better shape. But uh, by accident, I mean, I had, the, had an annual heart uh, check where I wear something around my waist for a couple of, the guy said, my, it's never been better. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I really, uh, uh, I'm a probabilities guy in my nature. So I, uh, you know, I, I there's gonna be 2.8 2 million deaths this year, and at age 89, I'm a little more likely to be than I was in that group than 10. But 2 million eight, uh, you know, and, and what have we had so far? I mean, it, 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 it will grow, but I've always felt a pandemic would happen at some time. I mean, I've, I've actually used that term, I mean, in, in describing things that can, be inter that can interrupt the progress of them not only this country, but the world. It won't stop the progress of the country or the world. I mean, th this is, this is a, a terrible event that's occurring. We don't know how terrible, that the, and it, it, it may not turn out to be that big a deal uh, when we get through, but it may turn out to be a very big deal, and we just don't know, and I certainly don't know, and nobody knows. Uh, but there will be other things that happen in the world in the next five, 10, 20 years. Uh, it, it, that's the way the world works. It doesn't. It's, it's not a totally even course. The progress of mankind has been incredible, and that won't stop. I mean, you flew out here, you know, yesterday or today, and, and you flew over a country that 250 years ago, there wasn't anything here. That's only three of my lifetimes, and there wasn't anything here. And now you've got all these bountiful farms, and you've got 200 and, 260 million vehicles in the country, and you've got 80 million owner-occupied homes, and and you've got 155 million or whatever it is, million people working. And I mean, it's, it's incredible. I went, you know, when I had a, a medical check the other day, I went to incredible medical facilities that are just two or three minutes from here. And 
that wasn't here. I uh, wasn't even here 100 years ago. And, uh, so we, we keep making progress. We haven't, we haven't forgotten how to make progress in this country, and we haven't lost interest in making progress, and that will benefit to varying degrees all kinds of people, including around the world. But there will be interruptions, and I don't know when they will occur, and I don't know how deep they will occur. I do know they will occur from time to time, and I also know that we'll come out better on the other end. And then what about um, the banks? And, you know, boy, they have been they hit awfully hammered. hard yeah. because of rates and the exposure to the energy sector, right? Yeah, and you don't know what other exposure there is. I mean, the credit standards have been pretty darn good, and the quality of what's on the books has been terrific, and the liquidity and all of that. The banks are in a whole different situation than they were uh, during the 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, but uh, there was, you don't know, you don't know the, the nominals that topple when airlines get bad, and, and then that affects, you know, uh, that affects energy demand. You know, it's just, uh, they're using less <laughs> fuel than they were. Uh, three weeks ago, so it, there's there's ripple effects, and 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 uh, there always will be in recessions. That's the nature of recessions, as you get ripple effects. We get ripple effects on the railroad, uh, you know, but there's just uh, uh, there's less intermodal traffic moving now because of the supply chain interruptions and all that sort of thing. But that's you look at again. I mean, it uh, you know, in 1942 when I bought my first stock, uh, the Philippines were about to fall. I mean. <laughs> It, and the day I bought it, the, the, the Dow literally was down 2%, and 2% and then was only two points, literally, it broke right. 100 on the downside. Uh, but 2%, uh, I felt it. I mean, I went to school in the morning, and I bought these three shares, and when I came home at night, I already had a loss in them. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you kept with it, because well, other people might have gotten Yeah, but I, I mean, all the other kids in seventh grade had their money in <laughs> something else. Right. <laughs> Getting back to banks, for just one second, Warren. Sure. And a specific name, which is Wells. Yeah. And are are you getting frustrated with Wells Fargo? Well, I, I think they've been through a lot of problems, but I don't think that the the fundamental franchise and all of that. I mean, I, I'm fine with that. But, uh, they, have, I forget whether it's in one out of every three households in the country, and I mean, they the mortgage mortgage service. I, they, you, it, it, it's it's. It went through something that various other companies, Geico in the early 70s got, had its troubles. American Express in 1964, when we got into it, it had the salad oil scandal, which everybody's forgotten about, but it was a terrifying event then. Uh, so we, Berkshire, they'll have, something will happen to somebody. You can't run, can't run a place with 395,000 people and, uh, and, and not know that something is happening all the time and you just hope you catch it fast. And the, the moral of the Wells Fargo story is when you hear, hear about something, you, you've got to act fact. Uh, and, uh, you can have incentives out there that are incentivizing the wrong thing. And we've had them, everybody's had them. I mean, you know, anybody that has a sales force makes mistakes sometimes in what they incentivize. And, and, uh, and, and bad practices will spread if not jumped on. Uh, and that's what you know. You saw it at, at Wells. They didn't. I don't. I don't see how in the world they made any money out of the phony accounts. <laughs> but uh, you know, the cost again. There's a ripple effect. I mean, if, when something goes wrong at Berkshire, if it doesn't get corrected, there'll be more problems subsequently. And then the, the, at, uh, when, when I was at Solomon, Charlie gave me the form. He said, you know, get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over, and. Anytime you see a problem and you're a responsible party in, in corporate America, that means just get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over, and, and don't skip it. <laughs> and just put that right in front of you and yeah. go to work on it. Yeah, maybe, I don't know about the get it over part with Wells. I mean, it, it just. Well, if you, get it, if you get it right and get it fast and get it out, you will get it over. Right. Okay. <laughs> and got if you it. don't, the other things you've got, yes. you'll never get to get right. it over. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let's switch over to talk about oil. Um, you are an investor in the sector through this Occidental Petroleum right. deal from last year. You put in $10 billion, exactly. I think, and, and maybe some more after that. I know you get preferred dividends, but that investment has to be underwater at this point. And what's your thinking? Well, the, 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 10, the $10 billion is a preferred stock with warrants. And with the, 
but the, and there is no market in it. Okay. I mean, no, it's a private deal. But but, but we also have about two percent of the common stock, and that's that's down significantly. And and you know, as I said when I did it, I mean. It, it, the biggest variable is the price of oil, and I don't know the price of oil, and every day it gets quoted. You know, if you have an opinion on oil, you can buy or sell oil either one year out or two years out or three years out or something of the sort. And uh, when oil was in the 30s, uh, there's a lot of agony in the oil patch. And, and the, the math just changes terrifically. I mean, it just doesn't pay to drill in, in a lot of areas. And the Saudis can turn out a lot of it. With practically no operating costs, or you know, I mean, they've got uh, very, very, very cheap operations. I mean, between that war between the Saudis and the Russians, and then also perhaps the secular decline of demand, given concerns about climate change, is this really a great place to invest? Well, I, I don't think the secular de demand will change that much, but certainly mm -hmm. the immediate demand has changed. I mean, the airlines need less, and people drive less if they're working out of their homes, and I mean, you, you can change. You know, when you're talking about something close to 100 million barrels a day, if you change it by 5%, you know, that is huge. I was reading in your annual letter, on the other hand, that you're mm -hmm. so proud of Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which is so big in wind power and has this whole different business model. So you think that alternatives actually have a, have a real future? Oh, alternatives have a future. That, and they are the future over time. But you can't change the world the base of the world. I mean, you've got 260 million vehicles on the road or whatever number it is in the United States, and I don't know how many around the world, and they're not changing what they use tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the average age of the American vehicle, the auto, I think is 11 to 12 years, something like that. And, and so the world can't change dramatically. And, and if anybody thinks you can change energy sources 10% in a year, it, it, it mm. just doesn't work that way. And, and uh, uh, But w the world is going in the right direction in terms of, of, of working toward uh, minimization of carbon. Speaking of those cars, I mean, look at Tesla and what Elon Musk is doing. I mean, yeah. that kind of is a revolution, right? Well, it's, it's an important change, but if you guessed on the penetration of electric cars, let's say we say so 17 million or something a year in, in, in 2030 when I'll be 100. Uh, and I would say that I'd be surprised if more than a third of those would be electric. Well, that's two thirds of them aren't plus all the ones. And so, of the total car, uh, of the total vehicles on the road, it still might be 10 percent electric tops or something like that worldwide. I mean, you can't change this mass of, of, of transportation. Uh, you can't change it in a year. Or two. It is changing and should change. Uh, but, but in terms of just the math of, of, of replacing, if, if we said we're going to junk all the cars we have, well, you know, the, con the economy would stop. I mean, we can't produce them. We couldn't replace them. What do you think of Elon Musk, though? If you met him, and would you invest in Tesla? <laughs> well, I think you're trying to bait me a little bit. I don't know. I'm just asking you. You can say no, no, no and no, or no, yes, listen, yes, He's done yes. some remarkable things. Okay. He's done some remarkable things. Have and, you met him? Oh, yeah. He's, he, uh, he joined the Giving Pledge uh, mm -hmm. some years ago. That, I've only met him once or twice, but, but uh, yeah, that's a, I've, I've talked with him, but not for quite a while. And would you invest in Tesla? No. Okay. Um, let's switch over and talk about um, bond yields and interest rates because that's a crazy subject right now. It is a crazy subject. And it is really crazy. Yeah. So what is what is your thinking on that? I don't know. <laughs> I have never been able to predict interest rates. And I've never tried. I don't. Char Charlie and I, uh, we we believe in trying to function on what or to focus on what's knowable and important. Now, interest rates are important, but we don't think they're knowable. And there are some things that are, you know, this gets back to, you know, something, uh, who was it, Don Rumsfeld or something? Unknown you know, knowns and unknown yeah, and unknowns all that. and unknown and, and unknowns. The, the question mm -hmm. is, is the box that says the knowns and important, knowable and important, mm -hmm. is there anything in that box? 
and can you tell what's in that box and what isn't in that box? And it's what I call knowing your circle of competence. And my circle of competence doesn't include the ability to predict interest rates a day from now or a year from now or five years from now. Uh, so I say, can I function without knowing that? It's the same way as predicting what business is going to do or the stock market is going to do. I can't do any of those things. But that doesn't mean that I can't do well investing over time. I mean, but things have changed. They're different now because oh, rates are so low. You have negative rates. It's unbelievable. And then you were talking about Edgar Lawrence Smith yeah. and his discovery about bonds versus retained earnings. And then I think you were saying that it makes, for as far as central banks, it makes no sense to lend at 1.4% and then to have 2% inflation. Well, it doesn't make sense for you to buy mm -hmm. right. bonds yeah. if somebody is telling you that they're going to try and destroy the unit in which the bond <laughs> the promise is included. They're going to try to destroy 2% of that a year. Right. And for you to now pay, now receive maybe a half a percent and pay taxes on it. <laughs> right. I mean, so where, where do you think these low super rates are going to go and negative rates? I mean, no, just no. what are the implications on? Well, I would say that's the most important question right. in the world. And I don't know the answer. <laughs> hmm. um, no, if, if we knew the answer, it wouldn't be the most important question. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I don't like that. But <laughs> no, but it's but, true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so let me, let me ask this way then. What has investing in equities changed given the interest rate environment? It makes equities look super yeah, cheap. Yeah, no, it, it reduces the hurdle rate. Right. That's why, that's why they like to decrease it, is that it pushes asset values higher. Because obviously, if you promised to pay me something at 3% a year, that would have been a terrible instrument for me to own, you know, almost any time in history. But today, if you're good for it, it's fabulous. <laughs> right. I mean, did negative rates scare you, Warren? They puzzle me, but they don't scare me. Okay, fair enough. Um, I want to switch over to Apple, one of your biggest holdings. Mm -hmm. Does does the amount of shareholder interest in this company concern you or Todd or Ted? In other words, it's the market capitalization basically relative to the S and P five hundred. Is that something you look at? Well, you look at everything and relate one to another. I mean, that's the nature of markets. So you're always trying to think about, A, what's in my circle of competence, and then what makes the most sense that's within that circle. But the important thing is to know where the perimeter of the circle is. I mean, right. that's way more important than how big the circle is or a whole bunch of other factors. So uh, I think Apple is in, within my circle of competence. I think it's an incredible business run by a a fellow that's one of the great managers of all time, and he was underrated for a while, but now he's being seen for what he really is. And uh, uh, it's it's an astounding. You could almost, you know, if we had a, I got one. If we had a card table here, well, yeah, we could put all their products mm -hmm. on one table. Can right. you imagine that? Yeah. I mean, uh, and I just think of uh, basically the utility of those products to a ecosystem that is demographically terrific and, and uh, finds that instrument useful in dozens and dozens of times a day. Uh, it, it, it's almost indispensable, not only to individuals, business, I mean everything. And you have one of these babies now, right? I've got, I've got one of them. I don't have an on me because I okay. would be afraid it would ring and I wouldn't know what to do. And <laughs> it's okay. You can take a call during this. We, we wouldn't be, have a problem with it. And what, what sort of apps do you have? Do you have any apps loaded? Well, they've got a lot of apps on it. but. But uh, the other day, actually yesterday, I was someplace. Normally, I don't carry it in town. I carry it out of town. But and and uh, somehow I was having a little trouble just getting to the. But this is only me. Any two-year-old could do this. But I was having a little trouble getting the part where I actually phone somebody. <laughs> I use it as a phone. Right. So you're not. But I got a lot of apps on it. Have you used any of the apps? No. No gaming apps or. No, people have shown them to me mm -hmm. occasionally. They, there's even some app with, with. Uh, me involved on this newspaper boy tossing thing that it's the app that, that uh, I uh, revealed a year ago in the movie. That I went I, I went out to, to California and and t Tim Cook very patiently spent hours trying to trying to move me up to the level of the average two year old and, <laughs> and didn't quite make it. <laughs> and, but I I supposedly developed an app uh, in this little movie we had and 
as I walked out, I turned to Tim and I said, by the way, what is an app? <laughs> we had a lot of fun. He is a terrific guy. <laughs> right. And, and, and that, is a that is an unbelievable product. Just a one more about um, those stocks, you know, the so-called FANG stocks. Yeah. And, and again, you know, does that approach a, a sort of bubble to you when you no, just see? No, it's just the opposite. I mean, you're seeing in this kind of a market, those companies don't need capital. Well, uh, Netflix needs capital, and they're new. But basically, the big, the big companies in market value don't need capital. And uh, that will separate them from even more from the rest of the pack. I mean, they, they have an incredible business model. If you look at the top 10 market value of companies, go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I mean, go back years, it's, you know, it's AT&T, the old AT&T, and General Motors, and Standard Oil in New Jersey, as it was called then, yep. and oh, you know the 500, you worked on it. Yeah. And, uh, but those companies needed money. I mean, when Andrew Carnegie was, went in the steel business, he built one steel mill, you know, made money on that, saved it, three or four years later, he built another one, and it was, it was capital retention and, and uh, oil you know, business the same way, whatever it was. And now, the really incredible companies, the ones that account for just the top five would, have, would be, well, well over 10% of the market value of the company, uh, the country. Uh, they really don't. They don't take capital. That might. That, uh, they make it. They, their suppliers may, in some cases, and all that. But, but they are really, overwhelmingly, they're they're, they're capital light, and, and that is really different. Then the question is, why don't you own, Google, and Amazon, those two in particular? Let's take those. Well, two. That's a pretty damn good question, <laughs> but I don't have a good answer. <laughs> the, I, 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 I definitely should have owned Google. I, I, they, the, the guys came to see me before they did the, when they were Larry and Sergey. Yeah, yeah, and they and uh, uh, and we were. This is a long time ago. I mean, this was before they went public. But they were talking to me about a little bit about it, and and we were using search and Geico in a significant way. So I knew the power of search. And I actually used search a lot myself, uh, uh, starting with all the Vista or something going way back. And uh, search is incredibly valuable to me and, and, and it was valuable to, to Geico. So I, I was capable of understanding that. On the other hand, I had seen that Google was taking out all the Vista to some degree. And I thought, you know, maybe somebody else can take out Google. And maybe if they'd started earlier, somebody else could have taken out Google. So I was always a step behind on that. What do you do? Do you kick yourself? What is Warren no, Buffett I don't. I've I, I made so many mistakes. You know, I, I, if I tried to kick myself, my legs would be exhausted. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it, you, don't, you don't kick yourself in the investment. But, and incidentally, you don't can, can kick yourself when you make a mistake. I mean, it is part of what you do. and. and uh, you know, and, you know, I was there when Ted Williams batted 406, but it, it, it was, that means 594. That right. <laughs> and, and what about Amazon? Same kind of thing. Incredible business. But it, why, why it's not too late to, to buy these stocks, is it? I don't know. But you're not, you're not buying them right now? No, but I don't buy much. Mm -hmm. that, right. it, it, those, those are the kind of businesses I think about a lot. Charlie thinks about them a lot. Can't help but do it. I mean, those are incredible business stories. Right. I mean, so the door's not closed necessarily. No, no. Right. No, not at all. Okay. Um, well, actually, you know, one of the other fellows now has bought a little uh, 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 Amazon. I mean, that, that, sh that showed up in our 13F. Uh, Ted or Todd? One of the two. One yeah. of the two bought mm -hmm. some Amazon, right? Yeah, that, that, that was in our 13F, yeah. Right. There you go. You took the plunge. Not Berkshire, me. Berkshire took uh, the no, plunge. Berkshire took. Yeah, Berkshire. They can do anything they want to do. They can't short Berkshires. There are a few stocks. <laughs> and then speaking a little bit more about Amazon and Jeff Bezos, he owns the Washington Post. Yeah. They offered it to you. My understanding is when it was for sale, or I mean, you talked yeah, to Don. Yeah, I, I talked to Don. Talk, sure. And and why or do you regret not buying it, or no, did you I, not? That, 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 if I buy anything, it's got to be for Berkshire. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm, 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 uh, I'm just committed that way. I'm mentally, uh, Berkshire comes before me, <laughs> and and uh, it would have been a mistake for the for 
Berkshire on the Washington Post. That, uh, because of the political stuff? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Right, right. People would think, I, I will guarantee you that, 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 that Jeff Bezos is not telling Fred Hyatt, <laughs> you know, or, or anybody there at uh, Marty Burr. Uh, it, it, but I'll bet, I'll bet 80 percent of the people, you know, or some, some huge number of people just generally think that, that if you own a newspaper, you tell them what to run every day. I mean, it's just, it, it, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't happen very often. It used to happen with some papers, obviously, and it probably does still happen with some papers, but it, that is not the way it generally works, and it certainly wouldn't be the way it would work at the Washington Post. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like President Trump may think that. Yeah, well, a lot of, I mean, Kay Graham did not tell uh, Ben Bradley what to write. I can, you right. know, that I know. I mean, and, and well, and, and I know Don Graham, but I mean, it, it, they just don't do it. But I will guarantee you that, you know, particularly among uh, political figures, but, but I'm mean, really the, the man on the street, that, they, 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 90 percent of them probably would, would think that the that the Graham family was telling telling editors what to do. I know you're reluctant to wade into politics. Yep. But I, I want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I may demonstrate that reluctance. Right. Here okay. Right. Well, good. You will in a second. I'm sure. But you know, we've talked about this before, Warren. That the country seems to be fairly divided up, and you said it's eventually going to get back together. You still feel that way? Oh, sure. Sure. What will, how will I, we get back I, together? Well, if you, you could have asked me the same question during the Vietnam period, and I will tell you it was, it was even more intense. I mean, I watched, I happened to be in New York at the time, and I watched that crowd come up uh, uh, to Wall Street. I mean, it's coming up whichever street that is, Broad Street. Oh, no, it would be, yeah, it may have been Wall and Broad, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've, I have seen in, there are demonstrators. The yeah, and, and, and during the Vietnam period, I mean, people were just as inflamed, I would say, on both sides. I mean, there were, it was, it was, and it went on a long time. And, uh, uh, you know, it caused the president not to run again in the case of Johnson. Uh, so this country's been, we had a civil war. I mean, uh, you know, it, uh, so we've, we've had, we've always had, we're a democracy, you know. We've got, we'll have strong opinions on both sides, and sometimes they, they rev up more than others. But uh, I do not regard this as some unique period in history. Although everybody, I've been reading about unique periods in history ever, <laughs> ever since I was old enough to read. So, I, <laughs> some of the things that my my dad. Listen, I grew up in a household uh, that that it was the family's belief. Uh, and it went beyond my dad and my mother, but went to you know all my uncles and all. I mean that basically that that uh, the, the country had gone socialist, you know, in, in the 30s. Your father was a Republican congressman. Uh, yeah, yeah, very Republican. Um, we didn't get dessert at dinner until we said something nasty about Roosevelt. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> my sisters and I, we just, you know, it was sort of ritualistic. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> There are calls on the political left and the Democrats to tax billionaires, have a wealth tax. Would that stuff be productive and maybe close the wealth and income gap? Well, I think that, I think I wrote something seven or eight years ago that, about the fact that there was, <clears throat> the, I was doing a little hyperbole, but there was class warfare and my class was winning, you know, basically. I, 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 there's no question that, that that capitalism, as it gets more advanced, will widen the gap between the people that have market skills, whatever that market demands, and, uh, and others, unless government does something in between, which, say, the earned income tax credit or all, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and I think that's a proper function. So I would, I would, I would say that if people they, it, it isn't some diabolical plot or anything, mm -hmm. but look at it this way. If, if you go back to 1800 and 80% of the people were farmers and you were the best farmer in Omaha and I was the worst, the difference in our value might be two to one. You might be worth twice as much if we were out there picking corn or whatever we might be mm -hmm. doing or planting. Uh, 
But now there's, we'll say, 2 million times. There's 30 million American males between 20 and 35. And if you're in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 in basketball ability or football ability or baseball ability, you aren't worth anything. If you're in the top hundredth of 1%, you're getting close. So if, that's, if the payoff is huge because some guy discovered television many years ago and another guy discovered pay TV or cable and then pay TV, so that your talents, where Ted Williams got $20,000 a year for batting 406, your talents now, if you, if you make the majors, still doesn't pay well in the minors, but if you finally get to that one hundredth of 1%, now you're, you're worth millions. And uh, one tenth of one percent, you can that is amazing. you can just play sandlot ball, and hmm. so you get this pushing of extreme rewards to people who are very very good at something the market demands, and people demand entertainment. They demand people apparently that arbitrage securities. You know, I mean, there's all there's certain specialties, and. Uh, that isn't because a bunch of people are sitting in a room deciding we're going to figure out how to take it away from the poor or anything like that. It's because of the market system. But we want the market system to keep functioning that way. But we don't want people left behind in a society where you've got $60,000 plus of GDP per capita. It, it, uh, and that the people on the, on, in, in the lower half have been getting, falling behind the gains overall achieved by the country. And we've, they aren't worse off than they were 20 years ago. They're, they're somewhat better off. And they're better off, they're better off because of things like an iPhone. I mean, you know, that's, that's something that's terribly useful. And, and, uh, and everybody, I, I get the benefits of search, you know, for nothing, you know, basically. And, uh, but that's the ultimate tension, is how do you keep a system that produces inc incredible benefits for everybody, you know. Sports is an easy example because we all like to, to, to watch them. We don't want to watch a bunch of guys like you and me play, <laughs> play basketball. <laughs> so that's where the money is. But yeah. that didn't exist 200 but years ago. But then how do, what, how do we address that? We address it through things like the earned income tax credit. And we, we address it so that anybody that works 40 hours a week and has a couple of kids that they don't need a second job in the family. They can have a decent life. Does that mean increasing the minimum wage? It means increasing the earned income tax credit right, because yeah, I think yeah, that's a right. better system. Yeah, what they right. need is more money in their pocket. Yeah. Now you can do more money in the pocket through a minimum wage, but you don't work, have as many people working. Yeah. You, you need something so they have money in their pocket. Right. And we can do that and that does require a, in my view, it requires higher taxes on people that where they were born into this world with peculiar talents that, that marvelously now and, and 200 years ago, they would have been out there picking corn with me. Can you take the higher taxes on wealthy people and put it directly to the earned income tax credit? Well, you could. I mean, because people complain, oh, my taxes are going well, up. They're squandered. Uh, yeah, it, nobody likes taxes, obviously. Yeah, but if you put had a program where it was earmarked. Well, that's, that's what people do when they're, when they're on the debate stage. You know, currently it's the Democrats, and they, they tell you all their new programs and how they'll pay for it, but they don't tell you how they're going to pay yeah. for the ones that are already there. Uh, nobody's discussed the trillion dollar deficit we have, so to talk about how you're going to introduce some new. Pro but basically, you don't want to run deficits indefinitely that increase the relationship of debt to GDP. There's, there's, there's some point at which that causes real problems, right. although we haven't seen it a lot of places that you might expect to see it. But this country has the, the productive capacity to let people like me live extraordinarily well, or sports stars, or entertainment stars, all, all kinds of good managers, whatever, and still make sure that nobody is really left so that two people have to work and you have to hold two jobs and you wonder how you're going right. to feed your kids if you're, if you're working. Uh, you know, seven fifty an hour doesn't do it, and ten dollars an hour doesn't do it. But we can do it. We have the resources to do it. You said, uh, shifting gears for a little bit, you said you might continue to underperform the S and P five hundred. You might continue. Well, I, I I will from time to time for sure. But what, what is the appeal then to own Berkshire Hathaway stock? Well, 
I've got 99% of my money, you know, so <laughs> I'm, it appeals to me, but I, and it appeals, to, actually it appeals to a lot of people who feel very comfortable with the fact that we'll never blow it, <laughs> basically, and it, uh, I think that they could feel very certain uh, relative to almost any company that, uh, uh, you know, we won't be at the bottom quartile or something of performance, but they can feel very, they also should feel very, we're not going to be in the top decile either. Uh, we, we run it, we run, if you're a shareholder of Berkshire, we, we are running the business like you've got 100% of your money and, and you're going to keep it in and, and it's up to us to take care of it. You said that um, my market value, my value is not so high and it seems like you're trying to really create a Berkshire Hathaway that works well maybe not in perpetuity, but for a very long time. Yeah. And then you also said, we're well prepared for succession. It's almost going to be embarrassing how well. Yeah, well what, does that, what does that mean? Well, it just means that, 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 that Berkshire doesn't need me. And, and we've got somebody that's extremely oh, better than I am in many, 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 many respects uh, to succeed me. And, that's, and, 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 it, and you want that in a company. And, and I want it. I mean, I, I, you know, whatever the number may be, but it's many billions that will go for vaccines or whatever it may be, uh, uh, education uh, for decades to come. That, that depends on that. But more important, it's, it's really a couple, it's at least a million people where a disproportionate number have got something close to their whole savings in. And so we're their partner. I mean, Berkshire came out of a partnership. Charlie ran a partnership, I ran a partnership. We actually, we do look at the people as partners and we look at a partner as somebody who trusts us to make sure that we, we don't, they don't get killed in the process. <laughs> and they are not, if they're, if they're shooting for the top 1% of performance or 5% of important, they're not going to find it. They might have found it in our partnership back when we worked with tiny sums of money, but we can't do it. And we don't want anybody to think we can do it. You said a person uh, to succeed me, I think, just now. And, and so uh, is that a person that we know? Or is it, I mean, there are various people at the top of Berkshire that you've tapped. And there's Greg and, and Ajit are going to be on stage this year at the meeting. I, it, it depends what happens to me and what happens to other people. But, mm. but It's not that, Justin Bieber or someone out there. No, it isn't even Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> the, but... Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, if you take our te top 10 holdings at Berkshire, they probably come out, you only got 150 billion in them. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the successor is mm. to the CEO in any one of those 10. And I've watched a lot of successors come and go in, in those holdings. So uh, to think that we wouldn't have somebody able is just crazy. I mean, in, in our case, that, that uh, you know, it's just that the ultimate responsibility of the board of directors is to to have the right CEO and be prepared for if something happens to that person. Right. You said that we possess skilled and devoted top managers for whom running Berkshire is far more than simply having a high paying or prestigious job. How do you know that? Well, you don't know it for sure, but, but you've got to make judgments on that. You make judgments on a marriage, I mean, you know, and, and you've got more time to look them over in, 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 in selecting successor CEOs. but. That's the most important decision, though, that you make. It isn't what their IQ is. And it, it, it isn't even necessarily the top, maybe in a given type of managerial skill. I mean, if they're, if they're the kind that will leave you tomorrow, I mean, you really want somebody that is devoted to Berkshire. And, and incidentally, we look for the same thing in our subsidiaries. In other words, we, we've got a group of managers, and... Dozens and dozens and dozens. Now, everyone doesn't feel this way. I mean, but we've got a much higher percentage that feel that way than I think than virtually anybody has. But, right. but you, you can't bat a, a thousand in that game. Uh, another topic that people are very keen on right now is student debt. And I know that you have really prided yourself on helping students. Is this something that really concerns you? Well, it would be a tough consideration for me if I were going to school, whether I wanted to not only invest, I'm done at college, uh, whether I wanted to invest the four years. I, I didn't want to go to college that much when I went, got out of high school. But, but not only the four years, but if I had to incur, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of 
$100,000 in student debt. I, I, I don't know what, which decision I would make. Uh, no, it's, it, you know, higher education is really expensive, and we've helped out many thousands of students, and the Gates Foundation has done the same thing, and, and other of the foundations that I support. But, but it's just expensive. It's very is expensive. Is it still worth it? It depends on the individual. It depends on the individual more than the school. I mean, it, uh, uh, there's a lot to learn in those four years. I mean, there's a lot you can learn in those four years, and whether you do or not depends on more on the individual. Uh, I don't think it. I don't think it makes sense for everybody to go to college. You know, I, I, uh, and I'm not so sure it made sense for me to go to college. Uh, really? Come on. No, I, I'm not kidding. I I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I learned a lot by reading, hmm. and. And you know, I spent three or four years, well, counting graduate school, four years, uh, that I could have been doing other things. I, <laughs> and there were a lot of intelligent things to do then. <laughs> Who knows? I, no, I, I don't think it was a cinch. I mean, I, I had some wonderful people I met through it. The main thing when I went to Columbia, though, with, with uh, taking Ben Graham's course, I already knew what he was going to say. I mean, I, I, I read it. I understood. You know, I mean, he was a very good writer. But it was inspirational. It was inspirational more than it was educational. We have a few questions from um, our audience at Yahoo Finance uh, from Twitter. One is, what advice would you give to a young investor today? Well, you've got to understand accounting. You've got to, that's got to be like a language to you. And uh, so yeah, you have to know what you're reading. I mean, and, and, and unless you know that language. and, and and some people have more aptitude for that than others. I, I know, but, uh, and that's one thing I learned by myself. Now I took courses in it afterwards, for example, but I, I learned it myself in it largely. Uh, so you have to do that, and you have to have the attitude that you're buying part of a business and not that you're buying something that wiggles around on a charter that has resistance zones or 200-day moving averages or that you buy puts or calls on or anything like that. You're buying part of a business. And if you buy intelligently into a business, you're going to make money. And then you have to buy something that, in my view, which you do if you're buying a business, that you're not going to get a quote on for five years, that they're going to close the stock exchange tomorrow for five years, and that you'll be happy owning it as a business. If you owned Coca-Cola, it didn't really make any difference in 1920. That, that when it went public, the important thing was what I was doing with customers. And you probably would have been better off if there wasn't any market in it yeah. for 30 or 40 years, because then you wouldn't have gotten tempted to sell it. <laughs> and you'd just watch the business, and you'd watch it grow, and, and uh, you'd feel happy. So you, the, the proper attitude toward investing is, is much more important than any technical skills. Another question from uh, one of our audience members, with all your success, what keeps you and Charlie going? We have so much fun. Uh, I just talked to him the other day for an hour, and uh, 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 we have fun every time we talk. And we are having, we are doing what we love to do with people we love every day. And, you know, I've been lucky on health. I, God knows, uh, you know, how Charlie in 96 and me at 89 with our habits and everything, it's, it's a, it's a, I don't know what it's a testament to. I think actually it, being happy in what you're doing makes a huge difference. And you don't want to go around having grudges against people. And I mean, all these things that cause you to think negatively, whether it's about the world or about individuals or about your own bad luck or anything of the sort. Just forget it, you know, basically. I think, I, I think that helps. How do you clear that stuff out of your mind? I, I don't know whether you're born to some extent that way, but it cert you certainly see that it works, Andy. You know, I mean, you just take the people you know and the ones that are sour in the world, the world gets sour on, you know, basically. And, and mm. so it's, uh, now it's got to be tough, you know, and, and certainly if, if you've got some major illness or something, you're sorry, I mean, that's just, you can have terrible luck in life and, that, that, that's, and it can seem very unfair to you, but, but uh, uh, you're going to have you're going to have a better experience in life if, if, if basically you, you, know, you see the positive sides of things. People will see the positive things in you at that point. And, and if, you can find, if you can find some, uh, I'd say look for the job that you would take if you didn't need a job. And 
if you can find that where you're actually, I don't, I don't think I've had a job. I mean, I've never, I would define work as doing something when you'd rather be doing something else. Hmm. And, and, you know, when I sold shirts at pennies and I was getting 75 cents an hour, I would rather have been doing something else. <laughs> but since I've been certainly 24, I've always, I've never, there wasn't anything else I wanted to do. And I had everything I needed and life was wonderful. And, and I tell the students that, you know, you gotta live. So you, you may take a job at first for some organization that you don't admire or work for somebody you don't admire, but, but look for somebody you admire. Look, look for somebody where you're looking forward to working with them that day and doing something that you're looking forward to, that you'd do if you didn't need the money. And Charlie and I found that a long time ago. And you're going to turn 90, what, in a few months? Well, about five months, yeah. Five months. Yeah, I'll send you a reminder. I'll send you a present. So, <laughs> well, that's what you're, you're looking really for. Get a yeah, you, right. you get a second reminder, actually. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> so looking back over these years, what are you most proud of? Oh, I, well, I, I'm, I'm certainly, but I have to give all the credit to their mother, but I'm certainly proud of how, how my children have worked out. I mean, that's not easy, in a sense, having a name that becomes famous or, you know, and thought of as having all kinds of money, although they don't. Uh, uh, but all three of them are now in their 60s. In fact, you're looking at the guy whose youngest child is 61. I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and they've all, they've all lived very productive lives and they, and they all get along fine with each other. And, they, and uh, I, I've, seen a lot of rich families and doesn't always work out that way. And another question from the audience, if you were going to start a business today, what kind of company or what industry would you look to get into? I, I, I do the same thing I've done. I mean, I, I'm, Can everyone I'm, do what you do though? I mean, do you I, think that? I'm cut out for, for managing money. Right. And, you know, it doesn't mean, it makes, you know, it's different people have different kinds of minds. I, I, I play bridge with people who can remember the hand they played 30 years ago, you know, and, and watch a basketball game at the same time. But, but, so there's all kinds of different smarts that people have. And, and I've been fortunate enough that I might have been in something that pays off big. And I could be, you know, very good at something else that just as much utility to society, but it doesn't. That it doesn't fit the market system as well. And then uh, just finally, what um, celebrities that you talked to this year? Oh, you! <laughs> Hardly. I mean, how, do that, how do people like Katy Perry or LeBron James get in touch with you? Oh, it, it just, I'm easy to find. I am so okay. easy to find. Yeah, I, and I see all the mail that comes in. Or, and I, I'm not a hard guy to access. All right, so write him a letter. All right, we're going to leave it at that. Warren Buffett, Chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, thank, thanks so much for your time. It's been fun, thanks. I'm Andy Serwer. You've been watching Influencers. We'll see you next time.